morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Renick Bromley. Um, I work for a company called Axia ASD, um, who are a private neurodevelopmental assessment and therapy service based in Chester. Um, and I also work as a mental health nurse in a head fan mental health unit in Wrexham, um, which is part of Wrexham Myler Hospital. Um, so I'll go through a little bit of the structure of the session and I'll talk a little bit about what, uh, what I do. Um, so we're going to talk around these uh, subjects and I'll, uh, it, it's very flexible. I'm not a very structured person usually, so um, <laughs> uh, so it's going to be very open. And if, any, if anyone has any questions at any point, please chime in. If you want to contest me on anything, please do. I really welcome any kind of um, any kind of other opinions. So that would be really helpful. So first of all, we'll talk about um, how we define neurodiversity and some common misconceptions that um, that exist around it. <clears throat> um, you know, a lot of a lot of people's interpretations can um, be based off of what they hear. Um, you know, r r rather than necessarily uh, necessarily fact <laughs> so I'll try to dispel some of the things that um, that, that may that may be around it um, we're going to speak specifically about uh, dyslexia and Erlen syndrome okay we'll talk about them together um, dyspraxia also known as uh, DCD or the full name is developmental coordination disorder um, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder ADHD and autism spectrum disorder which is ASD um, so the importance of these of these um, conditions as well. I mean, obviously, as, as um, learning disability uh, nurses, you'll be I'm sure you'll be immediately aware. <laughs> um, then we'll have a break, fifteen minutes or something, whichever is comfortable. Um, I'll talk a little bit about statistics, um, my own kind of research into it. Um, well, yeah, the, the way you can kind of apply it to practice as well, and uh, then I suppose some time for feedback and questions at the end if anyone has any. So um, basically at Axia, we, um, so by virtue of the fact that we're a private service, we have different um, assessment criteria than uh, the NHS. Usually the NHS um, relies on having uh, multidisciplinary, I mean, we have, so we have multidisciplinary assessments um, for people, but they're usually more of a um, structured and long-term process than what we have at Axia. Um, the way we do things with us, it tends to be a two... So everything culminates in a two-hour-long interview. We send out a questionnaire um, asking for the developmental history of uh, the person being assessed. Um, obviously, sometimes it can be a little bit difficult to get a lot of the early history for the person if they're an adult or, say, in their, you know, in their later years. Um, but, the, you know, the, the questionnaire itself can be filled out by... Um, the person, any close family members, friends, anyone who knows them very well, just gives us like a breadth of information. Um, it explores things like uh, sensory experiences, so are they hypersensitive to sound, meaning might they cover their ears if they're young, um, whenever there's a hand dryer in the room, uh, you know, uh, any oversensitivity to light, say do they have to wear sunglasses outdoors all the time, or wear a hat to cover their face all the time. Um, we talk about social interaction, um, use of body language, uh, facial expression, um, how well they can read other people's body language and facial expression, uh, things like um, literal language. Um, typically, people with autism are, are quite literal, um, and that, that's a bit of a trope as well. Um, but also, whether they can understand things like... Um, what are they called? Um, oh, God. Like, you know, house on fire... Um, uh, water under the bridge kind of thing non-literal language or where it has like meaning that isn't what it says if that makes sense so kind of interpreting that um, and th this is for a more general neurodevelopmental neuro assessment so um, when we do it it's not just for autism um, if we identify features of dyspraxia which um, I will go into um, we'll kind of explore more because a lot of these neurodevelopmental conditions can appear to be like each other um, and I will go into this next thing I'll talk about I'll, I'll talk about none of the some of the non um, clinical stuff afterwards as well because that's equally interesting in my opinion. So this is a Venn diagram that we came up with that just looks at um, the umbrella of neurodiversity. And um, under this, I, I didn't mention uh, dyscalculia and Tourette syndrome, and that's mainly because I don't personally have experience uh, as much experience with them. I've, I've met people who have who have these conditions, but. Um, uh, they they fall under this umbrella term. Um, so, 
basically, I'll, I'll go uh, top, stop from the top left and work aw- and work our way along. So, with dyspraxia and uh, and uh, yeah, with dyspraxia, uh, it's commonly seen as if you throw a ball at someone, they won't be able to catch it. You know, they're very clumsy. They'll fall over all the times. So they'll look down at their legs, and there'll be a million bruises there that they can't explain how they got there. Um, it's it is however not always it's not just limited to um physical coordination dyspraxia people uh, dyspraxic people tend to have um tangential thinking which is um which means that it might be it might go off in seemingly random directions but you will probably but that person will have like a strand of logic that they can follow it back so an example might be um if a uh, parent so it's say say two people one dyspraxic person was walking in a park with their friend and um they asked their friend uh i'm trying to think do you remember that time that you broke your leg or something like that and so the strand of logic might be um the person went to hospital um i went to hospital once because i had an allergic reaction to a wasp thing i have just seen a wasp and so the strand of logic kind of goes burp, 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 burp. It might appear all over the place in like a seemingly random question, but there is a strand of logic to it. It just means that they can bounce all over the place, and that typically means that they can be more creative thinkers. They may think outside of the box. They may not even know what the box is or where to find it. <laughs> um, but it just means that it's a very different outlook, and um, these these kind of this kind of thought process is a bit more prevalent with neurodiverse people than it is with non uh, neurodiverse people. Also, I'll go into the terminology as well because I know I'm using a lot of different terms. Um, so, I mean, you'll probably be, be familiar with them as learning disability nurses. Anyway, um, so dyslexia as well, um, fitting in with this kind of creativity thing is it's it's not always as simple as not being able to read the words on a page. Um, sometimes the visual effect can be it can, it can vary between um, letters uh, changing colour changing shape, inverting, um, upside down, you know, whatever, or just appearing, you know, gobbledygook sometimes. Um, but it also extends to word finding difficulties sometimes. So trying to find obviously the correct words to say, or the order in which um, words may appear in, in a sentence or, or, you know, when they're trying to construct a sentence. So it can affect speech, um, but fitting into what I was saying about dyspraxia with all of these different um, tangential thinking, it can also lead to more creative thinking because it, it will be thinking, it, it'll be communicated or processed in a non-linear way, um, and so that's kind of where some of the word finding difficulty um, comes from, as far as we can, as far, you know, as far as we can think. Um, autism spectrum disorder. Uh, so, yeah, that well, again, there's so many different uh, things within it, but autism kind of at its core we look at um well it, it's uh, it's not always okay so people tend to relate uh, i'll just read from that because that's probably the uh, best definition um relate differently with a preference for routine um uh, also sensitivity to sens- sensory information as we discussed uh with an amazing ability to focus and succeed so um routine and structure for autistic people is typically um like a good way to go in 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 the way of uh, organizing your life mainly because if you have sameness and predictability it means that you're less likely to be surprised or have to deal with like an adverse event or like an adverse effect or something um if, if you're not v- with autism um thinking on the fly doesn't always come naturally and so it can be quite difficult to uh, process new things and adapt to new situations because you so autistic people are very logical thinkers and if something kind of doesn't apply to that logic it can result in high anxiety it can result in um uh like like i say a difficulty to adapt to a situation um and that that kind of thing also appears in in dyspraxia as well it's as a result of different reasons so if you th- if you think about with autism um about being about expectations and like i say sameness and predictability if you expect something to be a certain way and it isn't that way that can mean that the anxiety response is very high because okay well i didn't prepare for this scenario therefore i'm kind of in the blue and i'm, I'm you know I'm, I'm paddling to keep afloat with dyspraxia where there are difficulties with planning and organization that come from this tangential thinking and also considering okay well 
how am I going to um, organise myself to be in this situation where, like, say, for example, I need to catch a bus at a certain time. Um, I'll plan ahead. I'll say, right, I need to do this by a certain time. I need to do this by a certain time. I need to do this by a certain time. That's not as a result of a need for um, sameness and predictability. It's more... Um, it's going to be very difficult for me to get to this place unless I do these things. And so it, it, it leads to anxiety, but it's for a different kind of reason. Um, so the need for routine and structure is similar with dyspraxia and autism, but for different reasons. Um, ADHD, you will probably have met people with ADHD that, <laughs> as a rule, typically not very good at um, masking their ADHD. Um, but they're very... Uh, high energy people um, the hyperactivity means that they have boundless energy and so I've just noticed that the H is in brackets so that's um, you can get ADD so that's ADHD without the hyperactivity basically um, full disclosure I have ADD and I also have Erlen syndrome which I will talk about which isn't on this but I do have a slide on it um, so routine structure is also a really good thing for ADHD people because they um, it, it, it's difficult for them to put in place themselves, but when they're in that circum, but when they're within structure, um, the distractibility and the um, attention deficit uh, means that it's more difficult for them to stay on task if they kind of set it for themselves. Um, a, a good example might be um, getting all of the washing in the look, finding all of the dirty washing and stuff in the house and grabbing it all together and chucking it in the wash basket and then throwing it in the washing machine. <clears throat> And then it's all washed, and then you take it out, and it's in the wash basket. And then it's the additional task of, okay, well, I've now got to put this up, and, and you know, it'll take half an hour to hang all the washing up and to shake everything off and, you know, organise everything. And so it might just get left in the box, um, it, 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 in the washing in the washing uh, basket at the bottom of the stairs, and you know, <laughs> begin to get mouldy because it's just being left. And that, you know, partially due to distractibility, but also this idea of executive function, which is something that's present. And I'll talk a little bit more about that when I get to ADHD. Um, but having the structure in place to focus the uh, immense amounts of energy that uh, ADHD people have um, is really beneficial. And so um, among all of these neurodevelopmental conditions, uh, the, idea for, the idea of, I mean, hence why it's being used as a Venn diagram, is that there are overlapping features that uh, exist between conditions for different reasons. Um, but aren't you know aren't explicitly bad things but they just you know appear different in many different ways and it's just it's just to kind of understand where the differences lie and also why as much as possible so in the center it says neurodiversity is a different way of thinking may relate differently to other people um i think that's used more as a comparison to people who don't have a neurodiverse condition um so a, a term commonly used is neurotypical um so you know, if, if 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 you don't have any of these conditions, you're probably it, the way that the way that it's put is um, neurodiverse people don't intuitively have um, well don't intu have an intuition about how to speak to non neurodiverse people, and it, especially in autism as well. Um, non autistic people have much more of an intuition as to how to speak to other autistic people than they do to non autistic people, because there there are so many different social rules um, for communicating with you know in, in groups that you may not be aware of if you if you have um difficulty interpreting social situations as an autistic person may do whereas if you're speaking to another autistic person uh it, it would probably make a lot more sense because you're on the similar kind of wavelength it's, it's a similar way of speaking uh, of thinking rather so i'll move on to the next one i apologize for using so many different terms and if, if i've confused anyone um apologies again so um, I'm, I'm using the I'm using the words like autistic and dyspraxic, and uh, in mental health, and I, I know that there's a bit of a movement away from it in um, in in the neurodiverse um, uh, theatre. Is person first language? So it, it's a moving towards person first language. Wait, no, sorry, no, ignore me. Moving away from person first language. So in this in that in in this example, it might be. Um, a person with autism, or a person with schizophrenia, a person with ADHD. Um, th there's a movement now towards using the descriptor first, so autistic, because uh, it's not seen as like separate from a person's identity. And the example I've used is a bit of a tongue-in-cheek one, but 
in a person with autism, person with gay, person with blind, person with Norwegian. <laughs> so it, they're all, um, you know, th th they're words that would sound weird if you were to put them in that way. And it, I think the argument is that it's exactly the same for autism and that it should be seen as a more um, positive term rather than saying, like, you know, person with um, negative connotation. Um, the, I mean, there, there are many discussions in mental health as to the term, you know, personality disorder, for example, which is seen as quite a negative term and carries with it stigma. Um, and so, the, you know, the, there's talk about potentially re renaming that or, or trying to change it to so that it has positive connotations, because um, if you have uh, negative connotations associated what, with whatever diagnosis you have, it doesn't exactly help with your self-esteem. Um, so the 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 movement is ideally to embolden and to empower people to have those labels because if if you know if you're stuck with it for life um the thing about neurodiversity is that it's it's a lifelong condition and it's it's a it's a um it's a significant difference between you and other people and if you're seen as different you at least want to be seen as positive for being different and th so that's why there's such a positive spin i'm trying to put such a positive spin on this presentation as much as possible so some, as I uh, spoke a little bit about this just now, uh, some people find the neurodiverse labels empowering and may choose to refer to themselves using different terms. So, um, like I've said with uh, dyspraxia, uh, it's also known as DCD, which is Developmental Coordination Disorder, so that's the, that's the kind of official name of it, but people sometimes just call themselves dyspraxic or praxic sometimes. Um, in the same way, you've probably heard the term Asperger's. So Asperger's is... Um, what is histori what historically would have been known as high functioning autism, or nowadays you probably see it as autism without a learning disability, um, and low functioning uh, would be autism with a learning disability, which I suppose conjures the classical images of um, people sat in corners, um, overstimulated, and uh, you know like hitting self harming or you know non verbal kind of thing. Um, but people use different terms for different things depending on when a person was diagnosed say it was like you know 20 30 years ago they may refer to themselves as aspergers that's absolutely fine some people call themselves aspie some people call themselves aughty uh you know all different terms that it it, it just varies from person to person and the, uh, someone isn't wrong for referring to themselves in a certain way um you know if if they think it applies to them if they if they resonate with it then i say more power to them so I've used the terms neurodiverse a lot. I haven't used neurodivergent yet, and I've used neurodevelopmental. Um, neurodiverse is... Uh, okay, so basically, uh, I've said neurotypical as well. Uh, there's now um, some people who are saying that neurodivergent is the right way to refer to people with neurodiverse conditions. Um, because the term neurodiverse could technically encompass neurotypical also, because diversity also encompasses um, normality as well as um, otherness, <laughs> if that makes sense. Sorry, I'm probably talking on my ass. Um, so uh, just for the purposes of uh, simplicity, I'm going to stick to neurodiverse, neurotypical, and neurodevelopmental uh, will, will encompass the umbrella term of neurodiversity, if that makes sense. Um, also, there's a movement now to start calling um, autism spectrum condition, um, uh, developmental um, coordination condition, rather than disorder, because disorder implies that, well, it has negative connotations sometimes, some people would argue. Um, but so for simplicity's sake, and um, because it's also what's in the DSM, I'm just going to refer to things as, as, as disorders. So ASD, I will stick to. DCD, ADHD, I will stick to. Okay, so talked a little bit about it in the Venn, in the Venn diagram. Um, overlapping features of neurodiversity, and this is what you will kind of expect to see. Not not all these aren't always pre present, but they um, are common amongst them. And they, you know, if if you see a person with dyspraxia, dyslexia, chances are they'll have you know more than one. It, you know, even if ADHD, you may you may just have more than one. So language processing delay and I'll talk about this in the context of AD, uh, a ASD and DCD um, the when I was thinking when I was talking before about uh, tangential thinking and the um, I mentioned before about autistic um, literal interpretation 
if you're having a conversation with someone and you use one of the turns of phrase I, I mentioned, like um, water under the bridge, if you're a very literal, logical thinker, like an autistic person might be, and you hear a, a bit of language that, that doesn't mean what it says, i.e. water under the bridge, which means, you know, it's, it's, it's in the past or it's all, you know, it's things that we've been through that we both recognise and our relationship maintains through it or whatever, like, you know, something like that. If you don't inherently know what that means, you have to think around it and you have to think about the context. OK, so what's the context in which water under the bridge was used? What's, um, you know, is, is this person trying to say this or that by it? So it adds like a few extra steps to interpreting the, um, the language that was used. And so that when, when it's described as a delay, I apologise, there's a truck going past my window. Um, when it's when it's mentioned when it's uses the, when the term is used as a delay, it's um, because there are those extra steps that people with neurodevelopmental conditions have to go through in order to reach the meaning. And so, if you say something and it takes uh, an autistic person a couple of moments to respond, it's because they're thinking very deeply about how to correctly interpret the language that was given to them. And it's not like they're slow. It's not like they're stupid. It just means that because of their thought processes and the way that they, the way that their mind works, it will just take them a little bit longer to respond because also they want to uh, give the correct response or a response that is true to them. Um, in the in the context of dyspraxia, this may be because the person is is, is it's triggered. Okay, well actually, that the word that you used reminded me. Okay, you mentioned your mother. That reminded me. Oh no, I need to go and do this thing for my mum tomorrow. Uh, I'll make a note of that, and then I'll think back to the original conversation. And so, um, processing delay for dyspraxia may look like okay. Well, I've just my brains went off in that direction. I need to refocus to the conversation, and then I'll answer your question, <laughs> if that makes sense. Um, intense and specific interests. This one is more classically associated with autism, um, but is again prevalent among all of these. Uh, so, people with neurodevelop uh, new, new, people with neurodevelopmental conditions um, can derive a lot of enjoyment from learning about a specific area of interest. Um, I know people who, who's well, I, I'm trying to think. Of, oh, okay. So one of one of my one of my colleagues, um, his special interest is anime and video games, and he has virtually encyclopedic knowledge about when video games were developed, um, when they were released, what console they were on, and it, uh, you know, he, he does research and watches videos about this kind of m most most of the day. And it's it's a fantastic area of knowledge that I couldn't hope to um, contest him in whatsoever because he just, it, you know, it, it encyclopedic. <laughs> um, and there's something we don't quite, no one quite knows what it is, but uh, from what I've heard from aut autistic people and from neurodiverse people, is that there's so much joy to be found in obsessing over one specific thing if it's something that they really, really love, because there's, you know, if, if you know every single fact, if you trawl through the Wikipedia articles and read all of the associated media about it, say it's a video game that you really like, you've played all of the games, you've seen all the films, you've watched the cartoons and the, and the, uh, the Netflix adaptation, and it's great because you can talk with other people on the level about something that you're so passionate about, and those passions do tend to come up, come about more often in um, uh, neurodiversity than they do in uh, in, in neurotypical people. Um, I'm not saying that they can't, but uh, it, it is more typical. And also with ADHD, I've I've got a couple of ADHD friends who like devote ninety percent of their time to Animal Crossing, which is great. I don't like Animal Crossing that much, but you know the fact that they can just sit and play it together for four hours at a time. It's, it's, it's astounding to me. Um, but yes, that, that tends to be a bit more prevalent. High attention to detail but may miss the bigger picture. Um, so like I was saying about uh, focusing on a specific bit of language used in a sentence, um, it may, may be that you focus too much on that and then, so say the gist, uh, I can't use an example for this. Try and find another one. To okay, uh, no, I'll, I'll tell you. Right, so I was I was in an assessment for uh, a lady who was doing a PhD in art history, and part of her PhD was examining the Bayeux Tapestry, um, the one depicting the Battle of Hastings, and uh, she was able to identify a specific um, 
paint manufacturing process that hadn't been identified before by analysing a very small section of the tapestry. And by focusing in on, like, hyper-focusing, if you will, on a, a very small area, she was able to find minute detail that was missed by other people, but then also she wasn't examining, you know, kind of the whole area of it. Instead, she, she'd hyper-focused on this very small bit. Uh, it can sometimes happen with uh, ADHD. If you get too focused on doing one small bit um, of, of a project, then you can realise that, oh, God, I don't have any time to do the last however many words I need to write uh, because I've been spent so much time on this thing and now I'm just going to gobble to keep the rest of it. Um, it can be it can be an overfocus on a small area and I think that kind of ties into the attention and the um, uh, the specific interest as well because if, if you find one thing fascinating then it doesn't make sense to concentrate on many other different things. If, you know, if, if you're so focused on a small area of it then why concentrate on anything else <laughs> unless you have to in which case you um, fail your assignments and don't do that um memory effect so for I th I th with, this is all just kind of before i continue actually this is all kind of um you know uh, what's the word it's it's guesswork as far as we you know i'm i'm, I'm more just talking about like neurodiverse psychology than um, and, and my experience from having spoken to and met people um, with neurodevelopmental conditions. These aren't like hard and fast rules. It's all just what I've kind of gleaned from conversations with people and what I, what I understand from having met people, spoken to people and assessed people, um, and also having been around other, other professionals who understand the field. So none of these are like hard and fast and don't take anything I say as, as gospel, more just um, a, a bit of an insight into what I, what I know. So it, it, as far as memory effect goes, um, filtering out unimportant information and, and remembering important information like I was saying about those passions um, encyclopedic knowledge about anime and video games that's really really important information but at the same at the same time it might be oh god no when do, when do, I, when do my bins need to go out it's non important well, no it is important in some ways but it's unimportant personally um, and also like not interesting information so neurodiverse people tend to remember things that are interesting or relevant specifically to them as far as their interests go um, and that's present among all of them. Um, sensory sensitivities I spoke about um, it's again more common in autism uh, but isn't isn't exclusive to it so uh, ADHD people, disle dis um, uh, dyslexic people even may have you know you might have the light sensitivity as I said wear sunglasses out uh, wear sunglasses indoors uh, wear a hat to cover your, uh, cover light from getting into your eyes um, also eye contact can be a sensory sensitivity can cause people uh, physical discomfort um, or pain um, uh, it's very common among uh, among youngsters with uh, neurodiverse conditions are uh, cutting the labels out of clothes because the the feel of the light touch is like intolerable against the skin at the back of the shirt or something um or maybe not being able to wear a specific texture of material because it's intolerable for them to do so um the literal and direct communication style basically saying what you mean and expecting other people uh to say what they mean and so some people may see autistic pe uh, autistic individuals as easily led um but in a, like in actual fact it might be okay well I'll just take this person at their word if I don't know a per you know if an autistic person doesn't know someone they might not know that they're being sarcastic or they might not know that they're you know joking around which can lead to misinterpreting things which then um you know it, it's seen as more of a problem on the part of the autistic person when in actual fact they're say you know understanding a person by what they mean and so may not get the um social undercurrents that might be at play in in any given conversation and between all of these, there is comorbidity. So the likelihood increases for... I, I don't know. Oh, I think I might have some statistics after the break. Um, but the likelihood that you have any of these conditions increases if you have one of them. Or if you have a family member with any of these conditions, the likelihood is that you have a neurodiverse condition also increases. Um, and so, you know, y y you're likely to have co-occurrence. It's rarely as simple as... Um, but it, no, not rarely as simple. It's it's sometimes just the case that a person might have just be dyspraxic, or they may also have dyslexia, or they may also have Erlen syndrome. Um, but the the likelihood increases if you have one of them. So, 
So, misconceptions. I've included a tweet at the bottom, and I thought this was a really interesting one. Um, I'll, uh, I'll talk about it in a second point. So, neurodevelopmental conditions on... They, they, okay, so I, I did actually mean to edit this and, um, since talking with Jeremy before the session as well. Um, so, neurodevelopmental conditions are not, are not learning disabilities, but may exist alongside them. In the eyes of the law, um, autism is protected under the Autism Act as a disability. Um, I'm, I'm more talking with the first point. I'm more talking about um, personal personal view. Is that not none of these none of these conditions are inherently disabling? Um, a person. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about with with the context of autism. Autism spectrum means that a person can be anywhere on the on the spectrum um, at any given time. Mean so uh, to use two examples, if an autistic person with hypersensitivity to sound, hypersensitivity to light. Um, and relies on their mum for a lot of support is brought to a shopping centre um, with loud music playing loud, obviously you wouldn't say it during Covid time um, really bright lights and their mum has gone off to a shop and they can't find them uh, that would be a really overstimulating disabling environment for that person however, if they're at home if they're researching their favourite their favourite interest, say it's I don't know. Maybe they're maybe they're really fascinated by the football, and they're watching the and they're researching all of the histories of the players currently playing in the Euros. And their mum is in the other room. Uh, there's low light. They've got their headphones on, listening to one of the kind of music they really like. That's a really good environment for that person. And in that in that environment, that person would not be disabled whatsoever. You know that that would be an, an ideal circumstance for them. It's about finding the right circumstances and uh, in. It, it, it's it's a disability as far as other people need to make the adjustments for uh, neurodiverse people so that they don't have the discrimination or, or they don't or they're not unable to carry out any kind of uh, function that they may have say it's in employment if it's in um, university anything like that so that's that's explaining that point um, I spoke a little bit before about the historical um, uses of high functioning and low functioning with autism. So, low functioning. Uh, so, low functioning was historically seen as if you had an IQ of below seventy five and you had autism, um, that's when you that's when you would be considered low functioning, uh, and also and, and with co occurrence with learning disabilities as well. Talking about talking again about that classic image. High functioning would be IQ above seventy five and without a, without a co occurring learning disability. And some people ref some people choose to refer to themselves as either, but I I personally don't use them. Um, and uh, talking about the point at the bottom, the tweet that I've, I've uh, posted the picture of, high functioning is used as my support, low functioning is used as my agency. Um, low functioning being told that you you know you need these things in order to, in order to live a normal life or in order to be a normal you know in in order to have like normality and if you're seen as high functioning it's well why aren't you coping as well as as well as other people you know you're so in, you, you're high functioning autism you shouldn't need this support um so it, that's the kind of explanation behind that uh i had something else to say on that but i've forgotten apologies so not everyone will be a savant uh similar to rain man but some people may have special skills and interests as i talked about before um you know prevalent amongst different types of neuro, neuro, neurodevelopmental conditions um, but you know you do you do sometimes get people who are highly highly intelligent and you'll think so say okay so a, a lot of like some professional musicians who may be incredible incredible composers expert players something like that but they may not be able to I don't know hang, sort their washing out hang their washing up that they may have like mold mold growing out of their clothes because they just don't wash them. Um, a, 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 a really good example of someone. So uh, this is talking um, with reference to what's called a spiky profile. So really good at some things, absolutely crap at other things. Um, I'll use an example of a guy called who's I think he's an equality off no not equality officer. It's a guy called Jamie and Lion. That's that's the name of his act. Jamie and his stuffed toy lion who he brings with him and he's an autistic gentleman works for the BBC um, he's previously done I think it was 
IT work for the... I, I really don't know the specifics of it. But he also does in, inclusivity work and, and talks um, for audiences about his personal experiences. And he is highly intelligent. He has such uh, an amazing grasp of... Well, uh, I mean, first of all, of IT. And he's also able to get to the point where he does, um, he does public speaking um, and organises himself to do so. However, he can't cook microwave meals... And if you think of the spiky profile, like his intelligence is way, way up here, but his ability to function is way, way down here. <laughs> um, and so he needs the support. So it's not inherent, it, it, you know, it's not inherently um, disabling in some areas, but in others it just needs the support. Um, so neurodevelopmental conditions are lifelong. They are not caused by bad parenting or vaccines, and there is no cure. I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir here, you probably all know this, but there's an awful lot of literature out there that say vaccines cause autism, um, that say there are worms in the gut that cause autism, and it's all absolute tosh. And if you see that online, you really should disregard it. Um, if you see people sharing it, I would actually challenge them actively because it's very harmful. Um, and, you know, specifically with reference to a cure, um, I'm, I'm talking about Autism Speaks here, in, uh, which is a US uh, charity, if you can call them that, uh, who speak about trying to cure um, people of autism when, as I've mentioned earlier, it's, a lot of people see it as core to their identity and they see it as a very positive thing. Some, you know, sometimes there's negative connotations around it and some sometimes that can be drilled into people. But... Um, yeah, if, if you see people talking about a cure, uh, it's it's absolutely irrelevant and you should ignore it. Um, and as I said about the spiky profile, Jamie and Lyon, uh, neurodiversity can bring with it challenges, uh, but also significant strengths. Um, talking about those areas of hyper-focus, uh, that lady who was examining the Bayer Tapestry, um, I have no doubt that she, like, she is an immensely intelligent woman. Um, but then other areas of her life, she she wasn't able to, you know, um, some some social aspects. She wasn't, you know, she struggled a lot more with anxiety. Was obviously very high, and not knowing that she had uh, these differences until a much like she was, you know, much later age. Um, you know, just served to make her feel even more different until she had an answer. So it it can be it can be challenging. I'm I'm not when I'm talking about all of these positives. I'm not trying to ignore the challenges that exist. But there are so many strengths, and it's really important, I think, especially if people are diagnosed at a young age, to give them that positivity in the identity, um, because you hear an awful lot of negativity out there in the con uh, in in terms of um, in terms of how autism and neurodiverse conditions are viewed. So dyslexia and Erlen syndrome. Um, I'll talk about dyslexia first because it's the more commonly known one. Um, I, I mentioned a little bit about it in the in the Venn diagram, um, but difficulty with reading and word finding and language processing. So the, as I said, the words can change colour, shape, um, invert, and it can make them very very difficult to read, and it also lends itself to difficulty in finding words in speech, <laughs> um, as I'm finding now. Excuse me. Sorry. Um, so with Erlen syndrome also, and part part of the kind of like fix or fix, if you can call it that, for, for, for this, or one of, one of the ways to um, help people with this is is that they they use coloured overlays for um, handouts, like your paper handouts, and sometimes computers and things. So if a person um, is assessed for Erlen syndrome and it's found that they well, so I'll, I'll, sorry, I'll talk about Elm syndrome before I talk about the overlays. Um, visual processing can be a bit of an issue. Depth perception is affected with Erlen syndrome. Um, if you look at repeated patterns on a carpet or like um, on a wall or something, it can cause visual distortion where it appears to move. A uh, personal example is when I, when I used to go to a morning club before school. I would look at the floor and it would appear to be like moving and I would say to the other kids, isn't it weird that the floor is always moving? Does it look like it's breathing to you? And they would be like, what on earth are you talking about? Um, also, the tangential thinking can be uh, part of an issue with uh, Erlen syndrome and light sensitivity. Um, so, wearing those sunglasses, uh, wearing glasses that um, change in, you know, they change to sunglasses when you're outdoors and things are sometimes beneficial. But uh, the difficulty of reading can be alleviated through the use of coloured overlays. And when you're assessed for Erlen syndrome, you are, they give you, I, I, can't, I can't remember exactly how many it is, but it's a lot of different colours. Um, 
to determine which is the best to put on top of a piece of paper or a document f to enable you to read it better. And you can actually get lenses, special lenses for your glasses um, that have that overlay in them. So it you know increases reading speed significantly. You get a lot less of that visual disturbance that I was talking about with um, repeated patterns, things appearing to be moving, alleviates the depth perception difficulties as well. I don't have them, unfortunately. I need them. Um, but uh, as far as I know, you can actually get assessed for this through universities. Um, and uh, some, some employers are very supportive of this as well. Uh, but these are all reasonable adjustments. And so if, if you take any of these to a school, to um, employment, uh, you know, in anything, um, they technically should make these changes for you because if you've got official diagnoses of these conditions, um, then it's discriminatory for you not to have access to the things that would enable you to function to a higher degree. Um, in those environments. So dyspraxia, um, so I've talked a little bit about the coordination effects, so it's it's not always, a, it's not it's not as simple as um, being unable to catch a ball, it can be difficult with uh, so fine motor, so uh, a pen grip, um, using uh, a knife and fork, riding a bike, uh, well not fine motor, um, Balance is a real one, is a really difficult one. Um, one of the examples I've, I've heard used is uh, if a person, if a dyspraxic person is like standing in the middle of the room and there's no like wall or anything around, typically they'll they'll stand with their legs like this, um, and that's because it's more difficult to interpret where you where your body is in space if you've got a development if you've got DCD, um, and so you need that you need that kind of input um, to recognise okay well my legs are touching each other and there is force being applied to my feet therefore I know that I'm currently stable <laughs> and um, you know so balancing is a real issue sometimes um, the creative and tangential thinking I've talked about uh, it may it may appear nonsensical uh, it, you know a person's just talking off in a completely random direction but there's probably a strand of logic to it that if you ask them to trace it back they will be able to do so uh, planning and following instructions requires extra time uh, if you have these coordination def difficulties and someone tells you to I'll oh, go and take the bin out and empty it into the recycling bin in the road and put the and put the recycling bin in the road, um, it will you know yeah you, you have to think about okay well I've got to transport this if anything falls out um, I've got to p bend down pick it up and put it back in but what if the bin falls over that's really hard and then I've got to go and you know move all of these things and do it all again it, it it's just an extra layer of consideration that um, people without these conditions don't have and so it. it um, you know, in, in the spirit of not wanting to get things wrong or wanting to do the right thing um, and not create additional difficulties for the for, for people. Um, dyspraxic people can shy away from things like games lessons, uh, you know, I don't want to be picked last because, you know, lowers self-esteem. I'm, I'm rubbish at football because I've done the coordination for it. Excuse me. Um, so, yeah, so following instructions and kind of engaging in physical activities can can be a bit of an anxiety point for some dyspraxic people. Um, and when I was talking, yeah, so we may find it hard to compensate for change in routine or expectations. That's, again, about um, th having to think those extra steps into every single process. Is uh, If there's a change at any point, if you struggle organising yourself, as some dyspraxic people do, then um, you it, it just takes extra time to think yourself out of that situation to get yourself back into a position where you know what you're doing um and it affects every muscle in the body so not very commonly spoken about but um dyspraxic so it, it, quite literally ev every every muscle um so some people have verbal dyspraxia where the vocal cords um don't uh, function or move in the way that they should be and a person's voice can be affected they may sound strange um they they may not be able to pronounce certain words uh, may may have a lisp lisp um and also uh can affect bowel movements as well so um i know a couple of dyspraxic people who have significant I issues with um uh constipation and it can cause immense pain basically because the the, the muscles just aren't working in the way that they should be also very very common is a dyspraxic choke where um a person can just choke on nothing seemingly um like you know sometimes you can choke on water and things but it's very uncommon um it's very uncommon in non dyspraxic people or non neurodiverse people that they should uh st struggle in such a way um so I'll move on attention deficit hyperactivity disorder ADHD 
So spontaneous and impulsive behaviour. I'm thinking about in, in children, um, you'd be expected to lock doors and windows because there's a chance that they could try and escape and jump out, hide knives and things because the uh, high, the uh, impulsivity means that they might just kind of brandish it suddenly. Or it, it basically it's the non um, non not seeing the risk sometimes in the behaviour before and thinking thinking after acting. Yeah, so it may not think 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 actions through. Um, yeah, it, it, some, of, often the body it's very instinctive and the body can move before the brain does, and it, it you kind of get better at, at managing it later on in life. Uh, it, when you're a young age, when you're at a young age and you've got all of this energy and not much of this kind of understanding of what the consequences for actions may be, you know, say you're jumping off of a really tall climbing frame because you just you just see oh it's the thrill seeking it's the it's the, you know you kind of seeking that um, seeking that serotonin <laughs> the serotonin hit um, you may not think before you jump and you know end up with a broken leg something like that so. The yeah, so may may find it hard to. Uh, I think I, I would actually kind of alter this. It it can be difficult sometimes to get yourself into a position where um, you are able to adhere to structure and routine. So if if you're coming up with the structure on your own, however, some ADHD people find it beneficial to have a structure around themselves in which they can function and channel channel their energy. If they've got a task that they know they need to do, and they're expected to do get it out of the way and do it to a very high degree um, if it's something that they're interested in if it's not something that they're interested in um, you, you know you're not going to be mo- not going to be motivated to uh, to stick to that and to do it to such a high degree um, but typically if you've got the structure imposed upon you if you've got someone there to support you in getting through things infinitely easier and you're likely to see far less difficulties uh, but it also helps if it's something that's uh, an area of specific interest for the people for that person. Um, so often will fidget or appear restless when paying attention. So you know you've seen fidget spinners. Uh, you've seen you've probably seen those fidget cubes. Any kind of snapping. There's a really good one that I really like, um, which is bubble wrap. Excuse me. Um, it, it's just like endless bu- bubble wrap, so it doesn't break. You can just kind of pop it um, eternally, which is great. Uh, but sometimes when it appears that a person isn't listening or isn't concentrating on what's happening around them, it, it like say they're doodling while you're talking to them, it can actually really help. And and just having that say say for example, having like white noise or background noise while doing a task can actually aid an ADHD person. Um because it it just has that secondary stimulation. Uh a lot of people might be able might not be able to watch a film without having their phone out scrolling or googling at the same time because it's just you know it's intolerable to um to concentrate on something for a long period of time unless you're in the cinema and it's like you know all of that sensory information is in front of you and it's uh, it's a lot more a lot better for you to focus um poor sleep is often a difficulty uh Registering when it's nearly time to go to sleep, a lot of people will quaff and just crash. Like you know, that they they just get to that point of I've got no more energy left, and then they crash. And so, good sleep hygiene advice that we often give to people isn't very applicable for ADHD uh, for people who have a, who have ADHD because they um, <laughs> because they, they just can't you know settle down. Like they say, no screen time. Uh, don't do any active uh, any any high stimulus activities before uh, sleep. Um, you know, don't exercise or anything like that. Um, however, sometimes you just need to run run the engine dry and then collapse into bed, and that that's quite often a bit more of a uh, good strategy for ADHD people. Stimulation seeking behaviours, like I was saying, uh, thrill seeking, jumping high off of a climbing frame, something like that, and very creative and fast thinkers, and very common uh, misinterpretation of ADHD people is as naughty or disruptive or rude. And again, it's not it's not that it's um, it's instinctive uh, action before thought behaviors. Not going out of their way to be disruptive. Um, it, you know, they can be. It can be. It can. It can cause disruption for other people, but they're not inherently trying to do it because they're trying to cause issues or or be naughty. And it's very important that they in, in, ideally not be told that they are naughty or not be told, you know, that they're doing something wrong because it very quickly become internalized and I'm thinking in terms of a school in terms of school contexts if uh, you're 
always calling a person, you know, bad or, th- or they're doing horrible things or, you know, you, you're always talking over me. And it, it really doesn't set a good, um, a, a good precedent for how that person will view themselves because you can internalise, oh, well, I'm, you know, I'm being naughty. I am just a naughty child. And I see so many people who are, who, who, who tell me that they're naughty or that tell me that they're bad, bad children. And it's like, well, where have you got that from? Because what I'm seeing in front of me is an intelligent and active, uh, passionate and driven person who wants to do the things that they enjoy. And, you know, seeing, the, seeing part of those conditions as negative really doesn't do much for the person long term. And again, results in people not going to school, um, absconding and not finding employment and not finding something meaningful for them. Um, but yeah, I was, I was talking with Jeremy a little bit before about... Um, uh, what kind of you, you know some non-standard education styles for um, for people with neurodiverse conditions? And I think I think ADHD is one of the more apparent ones that they benefit from not sitting in and doing classroom learning on things that they are not interested in, and that they you know if you, if you struggle to focus on a certain task and not and not uh, and you need the stimulation, then it's not going to be beneficial for you to sit in a room for you know six hours or whatever. Okay, so. Lastly, before the break, um, autism spectrum disorder, and uh, so this is the one I kind of m- most most experience about. It's a very direct communication style, preferring unambiguous language. Um, say what you mean, literally as simple as that. Uh, it's difficult to think around um, non-literal language because you have to think about okay, well, did they mean this? Did they mean that? Uh, are they being completely accurate? Are they making a joke? There's so many different social connotations, and it just makes more sense to say what you mean. Uh, may find it hard to recognise non-verbal. Yes, yeah, so um, I apologise for reading all of the points because I'm, tra- I'm refreshing my memory as I go. Um, uh, it's di- more diff. So a lot, of, a lot of people will see, uh, unless you know the person very well. Some people will. Uh, it, some people may look at an autistic person and say it's very difficult to tell when they are at, you know, what they're feeling at any given time. And that's sometimes because the they don't think to <laughs> one of the people in um, there's a podcast on uh, BBC Sounds called uh, 1,800 seconds 1,800 seconds of autism, and um, one of the hosts mentions about updating her face, and it, it's because she's not thinking consciously about what facial expression you know, she she has to think consciously about what kind of facial expression she's giving. Um, with all of this. Uh, rather than having an intuitive way of socialising and understanding people, you have to put thought into it. And so for this person, she has to put conscious thought into making facial expressions that so I'm enjoying this conversation, or that's really bad. I'm you know I'm, I'm angry that you told me that or something like that. You know, so it, it it's it's not and then it's not it, the innate ability to socialise. Each of it, it, you have to think about it. You have to think through every step. And so recognising nonverbal cues when there aren't any hard and fast rules and set definitions for what a shrug means or what this means. Um, you know, some a, a person can be sad, like, you know, a person can be sad but not frown. And so it's difficult then to say, okay, well, you're not frowning. So frowning is typically associated with sadness, therefore I can't interpret what your facial expression means. So it's, it's harder for people who don't understand naturally um, social uh, communication to get the information from other people simply by looking at them. And similarly, they're less likely to use it themselves because it's not something that they kind of conscious they, they unconsciously do. They have to consciously think about it. So very firm relationships and strong uh, strong relationships with people. Um, it'll be founded on usually um, an autistic person will have lifelong and very, very strong relationships. With people um, and will rely heavily on them, and uh, that's mainly because uh, it's once you know someone, it's very like it, it's very difficult to meet new people who. Oh, sorry, I'm talking myself into circles. I'm not making sense. Um, I'm trying to think of an example. So, there's an autistic person who I know who referred to their best friend, their lifelong best friend. Um, of about thirty years as their uh, their so their social interpreter, and so by having 
a very close relationship with this person, they were able to understand and and kind of talking about not getting social cues and not getting uh, non-verbal communication is they were able to bounce ideas off of this person to say, okay, well, did they mean that? And actually, yeah, oh, yeah. So they translated the social situation for them um, on reflection, and so like ha- having that is massively beneficial and actually helps to um, alleviate some of the other difficulties that they may interpret uh, that they may encounter. But having the firm relationship is really beneficial. And once you know someone, it's like, well, I don't need loads and loads of friends. I just need a couple of people because I, I, I enjoy speaking with them. Or, you know, we share the same interests and it's good to talk to them. Preference for routine and structure I mentioned is about the kind of need for sameness and the anxiety around um, changeability and uncertainty. Because with uncertainty, you just don't know what you're going to get and you don't know... And if it takes you a minute to process things, or it takes you a little bit longer to process things because you have to think about all the other considerations that lie with with any given scenario, then having certainty on that subject is kind of vital, and n- not knowing anything is just results in stress. <laughs> um, so quite often you'll see autistic people who dislike surprises. If you drop round to an autistic person's house uh, unexpectedly, like say you're out on the walk and they're oh, just knock from a friend, they probably wouldn't like it. Or if there's a surprise birthday party, <laughs> it's not of, not often we hear that autistic people are um, massive fans of surprise birthday parties. So, a piece of advice for the future: um, a strong wish to get things right with a sense of fairness, and this this factors very much into the processing of uh, commu- of, of, of social and any given situation, um, because. If you ask a person a question and it's a like it's an open question, what do you think about I don't know, what do you think about Boris Johnson? The person might think very deeply and take a while to answer, whereas a non autistic person might just give like a kind of off the cuff answer like, Oh, I really like him or I really don't like him. An autistic person might take a longer period of time because they want to accurately convey their feelings and do so accurately and so will take the extra time to do so. And so um, underlying everything is, you know, wanting to get things right, and often autistic people will be described as perfectionists or anal or whatever you want to call it. Um, but it's it's to very high standards that they hold for themselves, and with a sense of fairness as well. Um, often in kids, if um, in in children in school, if a friend is being told off for something that another child in the class was doing, an autistic person might stand up and say, "That's not that's not what was happening. That's unfair. You're not being fair." Or if um, you know something goes wrong, it's, someone's being naughty in the class, and the whole class gets a detention, then the child might say, you know, might protest basically. And it's about it's about wanting to, the fairness thing ties into wanting to get things right because if if the correct thing is if the, if an incorrect thing is happening, i.e., everyone is facing punishment for um, the wrongdoings of a single child or something, then that's completely unfair and it's also not right. So wanting to get things right ties into that. Hyper and hyposensitivity to certain stimuli. So as I spoke about before, um, sunglasses indoors, if they're sensitive to light. Alternatively, you know, you might see some autistic people wearing uh, shorts in winter and, you know, they can go and swim in the ocean in the middle of winter wearing only, like, I don't know, a swimsuit or something like that. Um, Hyposensitivity to cold, that would be. Uh, Hypersensitivity to to certain types of pain is also very common. So uh, the... The phrase, a pinch is worse than a punch, is often no more applicable than it is within autism. So uh, the acute pinching or like a a slight cut or something would be significantly worse because you see the pain and it uh, registers as a different type of pain, say to breaking an arm, not realising it's broke, or like breaking the toe or something, not realising it's broken until you look down and only then does the pain start. So the pain um, response is often very different with autistic people. some some people can have uh, a lack of awareness of uh, internal signals, so um, how hungry they are. Uh, they may not realise that they're hungry, and like they, they may just not realise that they're hungry. Alternatively, they may be oversensitive to the feeling of hunger, and so want to eat constantly and have to be told to stop. <laughs> um, so, and uh, another really common one is, uh, particularly in in children, is uh, um, if you see autistic kids spinning. Or if, you, or if you see children spending for a long period of time, and, and you, you may suspect that they're on the spectrum, or the dyspraxic or something, um, the there is can sometimes be a lack of sensitivity to the 
uh, fluid in the ear canal which dictates balance. And so if uh, you know, they're spinning for a long period of time, they may be able to do it for ages and ages because they're not getting the internal signals that tells them that they're dizzy. And so that they can just kind of like do it endlessly, whereas uh, another person may fall over within 10 seconds or something. And the eye contact I'll just finish off um, is, so a very common one is that, a very common miscon or a very common idea of it is that autistic people don't make eye contact. Uh, and some uh, assessments hinge on it, which I think is the wrong way to look at it, because if you're being told all the time that you're not looking at someone and that looking at someone means to have a conversation and to listen to them, then... As, as a person, you will learn that, okay, I should be looking at someone in the eyes, and you'll learn the rule, um, you know, where, whereas uh, in non-autistic people, uh, generally eye contact is like a social thing, and that you, you do it to, to convey that you are listening. For a non-autistic person, you can not be looking at the person, you can, you know, be doing your own thing, but just like listening passively, uh, and so all the information will be going in. So... Where the too much eye, con eye contact can factor into it, or even like just a normal amount of eye contact, is that uh, it'll be trained into people rather than be a natural thing. As I've said, with interpreting uh, language, uh, none of it is innate usually. None of the social understanding is innate, um, and they have to learn it. It's exactly the same with eye contact and other things like that. It's, uh, none of this kind of comes naturally. Uh, between autistic and non-autistic people in the same way that non-autistic people don't naturally understand autistic people you kind of have to learn um you can have to learn um rules and cue not rules but like you know cues and um learn lessons about how to speak to people uh it's the same with autistic people and non-autistic people it, it, there's usually more of an understanding and a consensus between autistic and neurodiverse people than there is between neurodiverse and non-neurodiverse people okay so i'm going to stop speaking because my voice is going hoarse and it's time for a break uh, so I don't know if Jeremy wants to chime in but I'm happy for like 10 to 15 minutes or something like that if other people are yeah that's fine cool okay right I'm gonna exit the call and I'll come back in 10 or 15 minutes I'll, I'll, I'll should we say come back at quarter to uh, quarter past rather okay okay yes, thank you cool yes, yes thank you thank you Okay, so the figures I've got, um, th this is all while I was doing research um, for my uh, research proposal, no, sorry, for my dissertation, um, which I did in my third year, uh, about end of last year, or like August last year, I'm very pleased it's over with anyway. So um, the rough estimation for uh, autistic population in the UK is about 1.1%, um, the, yeah, and, and weirdly, 3.5% of children and 2% of adults with ADHD. Uh, so the there are slightly different um, population uh, estimations. I think the US has it at something like 2% uh, for autism. Um, but it's interesting that uh, there is there are two different uh, statistics for children and adults with ADHD, um, considering it's a lifelong condition and you don't exactly lose it. I'd imagine that's just because we have... Um, a bit better understanding of the conditions now and we're probably able to diagnose it better and so you know obviously there's going to be a higher uptake in children because teachers um professionals pediatricians and things are becoming more aware um but yeah so apparently between 3.5 percent of children two percent of adults are adhd and one in ten people are dyslexic i couldn't find one for dyspraxia unfortunately um but my dissertation specifically spoke about um the uh, pro what we had to do was so it was ten thousand words and it was um, we had to give a uh, re not a reasonable adjustment a quality improvement and uh, Jeremy said that you've all you've all talked before about a, um, a health passport uh, for people with learning disabilities to take with them to university. Um, that was effectively what I what I introduced to them and and, and suggested as the quality improvement. Um, so. I spoke specifically about autism, and hence why a lot of these are relation to autism. Uh, so, roughly, well, thirty-eight to forty percent of people um, who or who, uh, autistic people have a diagnosed anxiety disorder, um, which is roughly two in five, 
uh, and about 31% have major depressive disorder. And that was from a study in 2013, and that's 3 in 10. Um, about 17% of the population, of the general population, meet the threshold for mental ill health. Uh, and the population of autistic people in the key mental health services was as high as 44. So yeah, so the reason I kind of included these points here was... Um, Specifically with the third point was to illustrate the difference in threshold between uh, the prevalence of mental health conditions in neurodiverse people compared to the general population. As it says, 17% of the general population meet the threshold for mental ill health. Um, for anxiety and depression, it's 3 in 10 and uh, 4 in 10, um, which is at least twice in terms of the anxiety and uh, one, you know, 1.5 in terms of um, 1.5 times more in terms of the major depressive disorder. Um, the estimation for population in uh, acute mental health settings is, yeah, the the I, I was I was surprised by that, but then, kind of anecdotally, without, um, so uh, saying uh, as I've mentioned, I work in um, acute mental health, so that means people who are um, unable to keep themselves or others safe or wish to um, come into hospital voluntarily. Um, if they feel that they are unable to keep themselves safe, um, the uh, the bed that I work on, that, sorry, the ward that I work on currently has around twenty. You know, it has capacity for about twenty people. At any given time, I've seen up to about five or six, um, which is well, at least like so, twenty five percent, basically a quarter of the people in there. Um, if you compare that to the estimations in the general population. Uh, which it says are 1.1%, it means that there is a much, much, much higher prevalence for uh, people with neurodiverse conditions to enter into mental health services. And obviously, you, you guys, it'll be your bread and butter with um, uh, learning disability. Um, and, you know, m m you're talking about the comorbidities as well. You're much more likely to come into contact with autistic people um, in the context of learning disabilities than you are in the general population. Um, but the rates are just so much higher in healthcare and it's uh, it's really important to take note of that so even if people don't have an explicit diagnosis it's really important to be aware that there is there are greater likelihoods that you'll be in coming into contact with someone uh, uh, with a neurodiverse person in services and so it's yeah it's really important to note and some more facts um so yes yeah, so it's so talking about uh conditions that are very often um seen in mental health services um Obsessive compulsive disorder, depression, personality disorders, and anxiety. Um, the term diagnostic overshadowing uh, encompasses uh, where diagnoses have been given incorrectly or without or or, um, or have been simplified to be just a mental health condition when it could actually be neurodiversity as well. So I apologise for the mental uh, for the focus on mental health here. Um, I haven't got as much experience in um, learning disabilities outside. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm only speaking from my experience here. Um, and so some of the things that can be conflated are uh, the poor eye contact, uh, which may be also be present in depression, anxiety, um, uh, re repetitive behaviours in autism, um, and you know the need for routine and structure, um, adhering to routines that may seem nonsensical to other people but are incredibly meaningful for autistic people. That can be conflated with ritualistic behaviours in obsessive compulsive disorder. The black and white thinking uh, and difficulty socialising can also be in personality disorders, where you know uh, you think about relationships with people, um, the the common perception of the way, the way personality people with personality disorders um, interpret social relationships is you is through a very black and white lens that you're either you you're either love me or you hate me or you know I you know the other way or vice versa um and and I've mentioned kind of through this as well about the prevalence of anxiety in all of these conditions for many different reasons uh in terms of autism the anxiety can come from uncertainty and uh you know overstimulation yields to an, leads to an awful lot of anxiety on un, un, um unmet expectations with dyspraxia uh, getting into situations in which the uh, your differences may may be apparent to other people. Again, thinking about PE lessons, games lessons, um, kind of ex exposing yourself socially, uh, w where it becomes apparent that you, you know you have these differences. Um, 
with ADHD as well in, in terms of the, the, the speed at which the brain kind of processes things uh, and over processes uh, to a degree, um, overthinks in certain situations, anxiety can also be very prevalent there. Um, so yeah, it, it's it's the point I was kind of trying to come to there was just saying that there are many different reasons for all all different presentations, and I've I've spoke I've touched on that a little bit with different reasons for why uh, people with different conditions may need st structure and routine, or uh, why they rely on, or why they why they think in a certain way, why why they process things in a certain way, and the same is absolutely true for mental health conditions. It's not always as simple as. Um, uh, you know, e e even if even if you're looking at just um, an autist, uh, you know, a, a person with a diagnosis of autism and some other kind of, you know, so that they've had trauma in the past as well. That's also very difficult to kind of separate from um, from autism because you have to think about uh, maybe a sensory, may maybe a very strong sense of smell. Um, uh, so a se uh, an oversensitivity to sense of smell could also come from strong memories associated with the traumatic experience or um, perfectionism and wanting to get things right could be down to some kind of abuse which resulted in, you know, just as a consequence of, um, uh, you know, getting things wrong. Or, and so maybe that was instilled into them by their experiences. Um, important to note, very important to note also, is that the gender ratio is completely squiffy. Uh, so there's a ma there's a massive historical bias towards autism in men and boys <coughs> compared to women and girls. And it's thought, to, yeah, so I, I didn't even, I just thought I didn't even talk about masking, actually. Masking is incredibly important. Um, mentioning before about how a dyspraxic person may feel more anxious if they are put into a situation whereby their differences become apparent. The same is true for all different kinds of um, uh, developmental conditions. So in autism specifically, masking would be um, going to so it happens most often in children, and it's really concerning when it does happen because uh, the autistic person is trying to hide the things, yeah, try to socially fit in, and in doing so, try to suppress the um, you know their normal method of thinking, of socialising, of communicating, and which results in a great great degree of anxiety, which kind of erupts when they get home because they just can't hold in the the stress of it anymore. It's it's a huge um, cognitive pressure because they actively have to okay it, say something overstimulating to them happens in class in terms of you know say it's a very very loud room and they're oversensitive to sound. Um, they'd have to kind of keep a keep a, a cap on that because to to react in a way that would be natural for them might result in a lot of social attention being drawn to, drawn to them, which is equally equally um, uh, painful or, or uncomfortable in certain ways and um, the phenomenon of masking is more commonly seen in, in autistic women and girls meaning that they're less likely to present as classically autistic uh, because they're because they're dampening or, or trying to dampen their responses in um, in a way to kind of fit in more and it's only when they you know they emerge from the situation in which they are forced to mask that the mask falls off and then all of the pent-up anger and anxiety um yeah then just erupts excuse me um so also it doesn't help that the uh more popular diagnoses for women and girls who have black and white thinking difficulty interpreting social circumstances um uh and uh need for structure and routine uh, literal interpretation is another person is, is personality disorder is the massive massively more common one and we we see personality disorders diagnosed in men but again there's a massive bias for women to be uh, women and girls to be diagnosed with it well not girls um I think with personality disorder you can only be you can only be given emerging personality disorder before the age of eighteen at which um, after which you are given the label of personality disorder um, but the the um, discrepancy is currently being addressed. We did um, the the company that I work for. We did some analysis on the amount of assessments um, for autism and other neurodevelopmental neurodevelopmental conditions, uh, and we found that that we have had more um, assessments for women and girls over the over the past few months and over over the course of the pandemic, actually, um, which says that there is becoming an increasing awareness and. Uh, you know, kind of people are being becoming more able to spot it, 
and I, I've said before, but ideally, the earlier you can you can spot it in a person, the sooner you have the chance to instill in them a positive identity around the condition, and so they don't see it as um, you know troublesome. They don't see it as a difficulty. As you know, they recognise maybe the difficulties that they do have, but the um, but putting into place a positive identity is is massively important to preserving long term mental health because if you don't have a positive view of yourself, then it's going to be a lot more difficult for you to feel competent and feel that you're able to rely upon yourself in life. Um, and talking again about the rates of anxiety and depression, which are much higher in the autistic population than the general population, it is vitally important that people don't have this negative view of themselves. Um, but yeah, sorry, a, li a little bit more on masking. So it, it's, like I say, it... <laughs> The part of the reason I think for the lack of um, equality amongst uh, diagnoses in, in terms of gender, um, sorry, in terms of um, male and female rather, um, is that women and girls typically have a better social awareness than men um, and than boys. And uh, you know, you, you might see uh, an autistic boy who is kind of separate, separated, a bit of an out, a bit of an outsider or a loner with few friends in in a primary school. Whereas a girl will probably be more socially involved and therefore um, will be less likely to appear outwardly to be autistic. And so, it's it, it, it it's that's why it's important to listen to parents when they uh, express concerns or express that they may there may be something different about their child. Is because certainly in a school context or in an outside circumstance in which the child or person is unfamiliar or anxious, you're, you're more likely to see a masked version of that person. Um, what you need is the input of a parent or someone who knows them in a circumstance in which they can be themselves to see, um, uh, to see, to identify traits. And so when we do the assessments, we ask for evidence from a school environment so we can get the input of the school teachers um, if, if it's a child. Um, we have the evidence from the clinical assessment itself, so the two hour long and unstructured interview, and evidence from home from the parents who either come to the interview or may show videos or show pictures or something, you know. Um, generally seeing videos and things of, of people in sensory overload and uh, meltdowns and things aren't typically helpful um, because, you, you know, it, it doesn't really add anything, it just kind of shows, okay, well this person has a really elevated response to something and they're very anxious. Um, but it would probably it probably wouldn't add very much to it. Um, anyway, I've gone off topic. So next, um, so the considerations within nursing. So uh, yes, yeah, so the ward environment. Um, I the the conclusion I came to with the uh, with my dissertation was that um, acute mental health wards are not appropriate for long term stay for autistic people. Crisis admissions, where it's short, say like a couple of weeks or something, where it's you establish an effective medication routine, and it, effectively it's unavoidable to have the person in, in another circumstance whereby, because they because the chances of them harming themselves or or others are are, are high, are unmanageable. That's when it's kind of that's when you, you you need to have someone in over that period of time. However, generally the ward environment is too noisy. You can't control the light very well. Um, the temperature, it, it's certainly in, in the mental health unit I work in, it's controlled from down in Cardiff. So you actually need to call someone down in Cardiff in order to um, have it altered, the temperature in the building, which is obscene. So you can't balance these very well for a person who has sensory sensitivities. Uh, I've heard complaints from people who, very valid complaints, who are only able to shower at home because the rate of extrusion and the temperature of the shower are perfect so that they don't trigger their sensory sensitivities however when they come into hospital <clears throat> the temperature of the sh of the water is too hot the rate at which the water comes out of the shower is too fast or too hard and it, it m m may trigger their sense their tactile sensitivity um, or it may be too cold and they um, say they're hyper hyper sensitivity hyper sensitive to the cold um, it, they may be too cold and therefore can't shower, which means that their, hydri their hygiene decreases, and um, you know they'll, they'll probably be I I acutely aware of that if they're a if they're a clean person usually, and that may lower their self-esteem. So you know these are all 
things that you wouldn't take into account normally necessarily um hospital food if a per uh, very often um autistic people um are brand sensitive in terms of their sense of taste like uh i, I hear very often from people who uh who buy in like a specific brand of pasta um or chicken nuggets or something for their relative and if if they change it so they get like usually i don't know mccain's chips or something and instead they get as to value ones um inedible to the person and it's the same with changes of diet going between home and hospital it's because the expectations are massively different the sensory information that you're receiving from the food is completely different the, the nutrition is probably different as well so if you've got any kind of intolerance then um that's it that's another consideration you lack the control you lack the routine you lack the predictability when you come into hospital and all of these things can be massively triggering for an autistic person communication style is also massively important as as nurses you'll know that um uh when you say I'll, I'll come and see you in a minute very often it's not a minute because you'll get distracted by five or six other tasks and if a person if you're speaking to a person who takes things at face value um who, who takes things as what they mean to you know what they mean to have been said um a minute means a minute and if you're not there in a minute that's you've probably gone down in that person's estimations so it needs to be <clears throat> you need to mean what you say and you need to um use unambiguous and uh, very clear language in terms of, also in terms of information delivery um uh, definitely you will learn about the amount of jargon um that's present in nursing excuse me um obviously for again for people who uh find it difficult to interpret language that they don't understand or is that non or that is non-literal or that is what it you know it, or that uh, the the turn of phrase is what means something else than what is said um you need to go to additional lengths to fully explain things and so just um breaking things down into very simple and literal uh meanings when communicating with people massively aids communication and understanding and even better um due to the extra processing time with verbal information if you can find if you can give them a print off with all the information that you've just imparted onto them verbally, that's probably better. Um, but obviously be aware that if they are um, autistic or dyspraxic, they may also have dyslexia or Ireland syndrome, and so you you may need to sit with them and just make sure that they fully understand everything if, if they have those difficulties interpreting written information or, or verbal information. So, Or even voice record yourself. Uh, like, you know, <laughs> um, maybe the person, maybe you can... Uh, the person can voice record you or something and passing the information onto them on their phone and then they can listen to it later if they need to get any information from it you know so just adjustments to the usual process that make it easy for the person um sensory issues i've, I've already mentioned um i should i should talk a little bit more about the ward environment obviously if you're in uh um you know you'll be surrounded by very unfamiliar people and if you don't naturally feel as though you can socialize with other people it can be very easy to feel isolated and um in a more difficult kind of circumstance uh so you just need to be aware of that other people can also be triggering other people can be very loud um can also not see what they mean <laughs> you know they can so, so it, it, yeah you just have to Id ideally like you know just avoid triggering the person as much as possible that's that's literally the core of it uh, forward planning um, and routine and structure both tie into each other and also what I said about, you know, f I'll see you in 15 minutes means I'll see you in 15 minutes. You need to have the routine and structure in place for this person um, so that if you if you plan for something to happen, say it's a ward round with a doctor um, or if it's, in a, if it's the, phys the, um, the physio is coming to see them or something uh, at a certain time, it needs to happen at that time. Uh, the, the per, they can't, you know, uh, it, it needs to be impressed upon the professionals as well, but um, that they they can't uh, equivocate from, uh, from, they can't they can't change it basically. Um, and the forward planning very much ties into that. So ensuring a person knows what they're doing um, at any given time. Uh, very very often on the wards, you know, there's activities nurses and they'll have routines. Um, you can get menus in advance if they do want to plan out their food at all. Um, 
just forward planning, making sure that people have the information to hand to make the decisions and f- get into a routine where they feel comfortable as much as possible. Obviously, it's a chaotic environment and routine and structure isn't always possible, but you need to do as much as you can in order to ensure people um, aren't, aren't triggered. <laughs> um, therapeutic inventions, yeah, so... Um, Things like CBT and DBT, um, you, uh, I assume you will have heard of that. So um, cognitive behavioural therapy and uh, d- dialectical behavioural therapy are both very commonly used approaches in nursing, <coughs> certainly in mental health nursing. Um, but when considering these kind of approaches, um, th- you know, even things like EMDR, um, I can't remember the exact term, but that's that's a um, therapy th- therapeutic approach used for uh, trauma, is that... They should be adapted for autistic people specifically. Uh, cognitive behavioural therapy and, and dialectical behavioural therapy rather deals with um, quite difficult to grasp nebulous concepts that it would be hard for a literal logical thinker to interpret them in a way that makes sense to them and so DBT would probably have to be um, changed in a way that an autistic person would be able to make more sense of it. Similarly with CBT which focuses around challenging uh, people's logic and behavior um, that tends not to work because if you're challenging a very logical thinker who arrives at their conclusions after much thought and meditation on the subject um, they're just going to think that you're stupid if, you, if you're trying to tell them that they're wrong because that they'll have, they'll have already arrived at the most logical con- conclusion in their eyes which means that it's difficult to try to convince them that they're wrong unless you have a very 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 well thought out opinion <laughs> um, which is hard to have all the time um, so yeah, just be aware if there are therapeutic interventions taking place um, on the ward and with other professionals that they should be um, uh, adjusted to an autistic context. And special interests, um, making sure that people are able to engage in them as much as possible. If there's Wi-Fi on the ward, um, and you know, they make sure that they're connected to the Wi-Fi so that they can watch their favourite shows or re- or you know read about the things that they're interested in. If they are if there's any any capacity on the ward to exercise and you know any access to the gyms and things basically just enabling people to engage in the things that bring them comfort and calm um as best as possible um so that you know like i say the ward environment is not appropriate really for an autistic person with all of these extra considerations so you need to do as much as possible to to try to um to try to make it uh, like an agreeable say at the least <laughs> um so that's pretty much all of it um i'm going to talk a little bit now uh, so this is the this is the work, uh, the company that i work for so axia asd um so i'll talk a little bit about that and jeremy asked me to speak a little bit about the non clinical stuff that we do um and i'll just see the time so okay so I'll, I'll talk about this for a few minutes and then and then any questions if you guys have any please feel free so we have two sides of the business basically. We have the clinical side which covers the assessments, uh, therapy, um, uh, EHC, uh, education, healthcare plans. Um, these are all like effectively you'll meet, you'll meet a clinician and we'll go through one of these things and um, you'll, you'll, come out with, you'll come out with a result which you can then take to show doctors and you know access care and things. The other side of the business is uh, special interest. So Talking about um, going back to the overlapping features, blah, 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 where are we? Intense and specific interests. Typically, um, in younger people especially, but it's also very prevalent in older people, if you have a special interest and you're neurodiverse, they can fall into the camp of um, anime, video games, TV shows, films. Marvel specifically is a, is a huge one. Star Wars, Star Trek, like you know, you think of all of these classic nerdy endeavors. Um, they can often be uh, intense and specific interest for those people. And so, the special interest side of the company is one of, is my colleague Calvin, who um, uh, well, and, and myself. So I'm also involved in that. So um, uh, Cal, myself, and two other guys, we also we all do a, a, a vlog, basically talking about anime and video games. Um, and it's it a lot of people have like a you know have a lot of interest in it and, and they derive area, they derive joy from different areas of it one one of my friends uh absolutely loves a genre of anime called Gundam which is giant robots fighting each other 
and the anime genre has been going for about 40 years and he has the knowledge of like I don't know he's got mega brain in relation to his knowledge about it and so um, what we try to do in terms of the special interest is engage with people on them so the clinicians often don't have the first idea of what any of the subjects of interest for these people are um, and so Cal, myself, the other two guys, what we try to do is engage with people on what their interests are, find out what they are, find out what we can learn about them, and then impart that to the clinicians, uh, who can then use that as a bit of like an in, if you will, to establish a rapport and to talk to people on a level uh, and, you know, get a gist and just try to get a conversation kind of flowing because you can, you can learn an awful lot about the way people engage with their interests um, Cal helped in an assessment once where a, char- a, a, young, a young man was um, he played the video game Skyrim which is an open world fantasy uh, Scandinavian style game with dragons and magic and, um, and all sorts of you know swords and sorcery and stuff and the way that he played it so you start a new game and you can have any number of characters and they can be like fantasy races, you can have like an orc and an elf you can have a cat person if you wanted he always played the same character did exactly the same quests in exactly the same way, all of the same choices. And if if they hadn't got onto the topic of that video game, you wouldn't have realised that the routine and predictability was there for this person who did the same things over and over again because that was the way he really enjoyed playing a video game. Um, I've I've heard of an awful lot of people who engage, who, who watch anime, um, which is so that anime for people who don't know is Japanese style animation cartoons. Um, uh, a very uh, so if, if if any of you've seen any films by the studio Ghibli, uh, Spirited Away, Princess Mononoke, um, Grave of the Fireflies, or so th- the way that the art style is done is they're very overly expressive faces and in some ways can be very caricaturish. But if you have difficulty interpreting facial expressions and emotions, or n- not necessarily emotions, but recognizing what they look like or what what they feel like and describing them inside of yourself having sometimes that simplified view or that over um, overly expressed view can help you to interpret it in other people and that, that that's that's one that's one way I've heard of heard of it described um, in video gaming you meet lots of different people and you can learn about social interactions you know some some games have a lot of story elements whereby they have character interactions and and films as well as you as you probably all know um can have you know re- really vibrant interactions and relationships between characters that covering very complex um circumstances and that's why a lot of these things can appeal to people is because not just as a medium of enjoyment they can also be a medium of learning I've seen a lot of people who I I, I played Dungeons and Dragons with, who, um, you know, who who, abs- who I, I don't think I've I would never ever see them outside, but I go to a, I go to a game store where um, you know you can have like a coffee and stuff and you can have snacks and you all sit together at a table obviously not currently due to COVID, um, but and role play characters and you know someone will be pretending to be uh, an elf paladin or something like that and you know having a conversation in character with a person who probably wouldn't be able to you know in, in a normal in, in in an outside circumstance be able to hold a conversation for whatever reason um but having that shared interest and having that shared reason to be there to socialize with someone opens up first of all that person because they think okay well here's someone who I share an interest with I may as well, uh, you know, I, I can I can converse with them on a level about something that I'm interested in, rather than feel as though I'm being belittled or demeaned for, um, you know, because I'm because I'm not engaging with, so, you know, with a clinical with a clinical assessment, it can be a massively anxiety-inducing scenario because you you're thinking, well, I'm going to be questioned for two hours by a doctor or a psychologist or whatever about. Um, um, like uh, things that I don't even know about. It's it's an uncertain event, and reducing the um, uncertainty by uh, factoring in a person's interests just helps immensely. And that's something that we found is is a really really distinct difference about the way that we that we um, we function. Is that we we try to bring in as much of a of a nerd special interest um, uh, s- um, slant into things into our assessments. Um, 
So all of the information is on our website. There's a Meet the Team page. I'm on there as well, so I apologise uh, for the picture that I have up because it's not very good. Um, but if you if you would like any more information, um, you know, please give us uh, have a look on the website or even give us a call or anything. Um, excuse me. Uh, we we do uh, for people who have been assessed by us. We have a post diagnostic support group because we find that um, a lot of people are just given a, diagno a diagnosis and then said off you go, go do your own thing. So we do um, uh, six weekly. Um, Currently, teams ideally it would be in person um, meetings where we discuss um, it's a range of subjects. It would be um, usually around the subject of autism, and it will be talking about um, you know educating around certain around certain subjects. Uh, masking has been one. Um, uh, catatonia uh, and autism has been one. Uh, I've done one on. I, I actually did one on, on the dissertation, um, but very often we have autistic people coming and giving their own accounts, and we've had very famous authors who are autistic um, come and speak, people who've done plays. So I, I like to think that we're a bit different because we try to encompass people based on their interests and also not just have the professional lens of, um, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk at you about your condition for two hours. Rather, it will be like a two-way conversation, you know yourself best, We'll try to engage with you on the subjects in which you're interested, and you dictate the pace of the of the assessment, um, because it's not about us; it's about you. And you know, if if we're if we're telling you everything about yourself for two hours, then it's not going to be helpful. We'd rather hear your point of view. So that's the ethos behind it, really. Um, and I'm now ready to accept questions if anyone has any, and if not, that's absolutely fine. I'm not going to call anyone out. Then maybe Jeremy might like to chime in. If he's able to. Yeah, I, I did. I did have um, a question. If yes. That's okay, then we're... Yeah. Um, I think we might have covered it, but I had this thing where I was starting to write it down, so I remember it. Of course. So I might have missed you answering the very thing I'm going to ask. Okay. So I apologise if that's the case. Okay. Um, but when you talk about masking with girls and women with autism, and yes. you, you did mention personality disorder. Yes. I do remember. Um, somewhere where I worked, the the psychiatrist and the the manager both kind of had the theory that um, girls and women with autism are often diagnosed with personality disorder instead. Yes. And did you cover that? Sorry, as I said, I was writing. No, um, I, I think I think I may have may have touched on it briefly. Um, but yes, uh, yeah, that that's that talk, um, that fits into what I was mentioning about uh, diagnostic overshadowing. So. Uh, I personally think that um, I'm going to choose my words carefully here. That personality disorder is a little bit overdiagnosed, and I, th I, I think, in um, absence of certainty, it can be a bit of a fallback diagnosis. And uh, I think because of the interpretation of autism as more of a male-centric um, condition, it can be missed, and it will be put down to personality disorder. Um, yeah. The like I say, the black and white thinking and certain uh, you know my uh, over emotionality sometimes um, misinterpreting social set situations are all common between the two. Um, however, the uh, personality disorder usually rel relies um, on a traumatic experience in childhood um, in, yeah. in in early development, but the threshold for what constitutes um, Trauma is completely different between non-autistic and um, autistic people. You know, if you think sure. if you think about an adverse sensory experience, like I was saying before about, um, I'll use the example of the sh of the shopping centre. That could be traumatic for an autistic person, and so, you know, the, 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 it kind of frames the trauma in a different kind of way. But um, usually, uh, so, so what can sometimes happen is that clinicians will. Overfocus on an early an, an 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 early instance of trauma, and then think, okay, well, that just makes sense now. That that contextualizes the whole the whole person, where in fact it could be it could be autism also. So th there is definitely over overshadowed diagnosis. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. It's all right. Any other questions? Can I can I ask something? Yes. Um, so, 
in in first year, I, I actually went to um, to get um, what you got to have the, have an assessment for dyslexia. Oh yeah. And and dyspraxia actually. Oh right, wow. Uh, and well, like, that's that's what they thought, but I didn't actually go to get the full test. Right. Because they charge. Um, right. They, they, ch- they charge like a hundred pounds, and it's a hundred pounds whether that no matter what the outcome is. Right. Okay. Um, and I ended up feeling a bit sort of um, I don't know how to explain it. It, it was a bit. I, I didn't. I didn't want to go and pay a hundred pounds to then be told that I didn't have it. Yeah. Um, and that the the reason the reason for my problems were like were, were just that I was stupid. Do you know what I mean? Right. Yeah, I, I understand because I, I, I suppose in in some way it might make you feel in, invalidated if uh, yeah. Um, yeah. The, the best way to go about it, um, in in terms of seeking a diagnosis, I would say is is through your GP and justify that it affects your life because you you can't. I mean, you you're doing a university degree. Um, your your reading it sounds like your reading might be affected if if you're suspecting that you've got dyslexia. Um, your coordination is probably affected as well if you've got if if you're suspecting that you have dyspraxia. They do make they do make changes and. Um, you, you know, changes to quality of life in a way. I, I would justify TGP if if you wanted to seek an, uh, seek a, a cost free diagnosis. But it sounds like if you are confident of these things, um, then I would go for it anyway. I, I I highly doubt it would be because you're stupid. I don't think I don't think that you'd be you know in the third year in a in a nursing degree if you were stupid. So I, it sounds like you. And, and I wonder if poss- did you go through the university? Did you say? Uh, yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah. I, I went. Um, I, I can't remember how it came about actually, but it just a, a lot of a lot of people sort of said to me before, like, "Oh, you should go get you know get assessed." Yeah. Um, and I suppose I don't. When when I was when I was speaking to to the person that was doing the assessment, you know, she was she was sort of talking about like masking and things like that as well, because there was something she was asking. Yeah. Um, and it was uh, it did make me think that oh yeah, when I was younger, I was like that, but you. Kind of, you teach yourself oh, yeah. how to sort of go around it, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Like how to, yeah, how, how, like you said, how to make it less obvious. Yeah, yeah. Well, you, you, yeah, that, that's that's one of the absolutely that's right. Yeah, you you learn workarounds for yourself um, uh, to make things easier, and and probably not to display it as much to other people if that's an anxiety point for you. Um, I, I I don't know the exact process of um of of going through the dis uh, through the disability service, but um if they directed you to a paid assessment, then um I'm not quite sure how that would go. Um, but if, if you if you are still chasing the diagnosis, I would recommend going through your GP. And if you find a service that you like, in um for assessments, um you can do this thing called patient choice, where the um again you have to justify that um the uh, that seeking the diagnosis would make a reasonable difference to your life. Um, but uh, you could um, effectively that just that just means that the, they have to uh, what's the word expedite the process and um, uh, it, it's still paid for by the NHS. But it, it's it's surprising to me that they that they would offer for you to go for a paid one though. That, that surprises me. That's great. Thanks. Yeah, I'll, I'll speak to the GP. It's it's not it's not so much. It doesn't really sort of. It doesn't affect me that negatively, I'll no, be yeah. honest, because I've kind of, um, I found my ways around it. Yeah. Um, it's it's more just sort of, I suppose, validation in a way. Absolutely. And I, yeah, I, I, just, I just found the whole, because uh, I've, I've heard other people say the same, so speaking to a friend about it and her partner, also, he thinks he's the best bit as well. Yeah. And he, he said he had the exact same sort of experience where he didn't, he didn't want to go for the assessment to be told he's not. Yeah. But, but yeah, I think if, if you are, you, you kind of, you, you know, but you, it's, it's quite hard to explain. No, uh, no, you're making perfect sense. I think you're absolutely right. It's hugely validating to know that you're, that you're different and it's not down to laziness. It's not down to lack of trying. Um, you know, some, some things do get kind of in the way of it. Um, so no, I, I completely, I completely empathise with with your friend as well. Actually, I've I've known, I've known people who have sought diagnoses of of, of dyspraxia, of ADHD, and just having that, having the reason, um, is is mass is massively positive. Yeah, 
you know, like, like, like I say about uh, early diagnosis is that you can build a positive identity and then you think you, you can contextualise the whole of your life before that point. It's like like you were thinking, reflecting on your early experiences. Oh, well, that makes sense now because of this. Um, so, yeah, I, I would advise if, if you do if you do feel confident, I would say go for it. But I understand your hesitation completely. Oh, that's great. Thank you. No worries. Anyone else? Volunteers? Hi. Yeah. Hi. Um, just sort of piggybacking on what Sarah said, really. Um, what you obviously said, go to your GP. I've had quite a negative um, experience with that. I felt like I was fobbed off. Mm. It wasn't me personally. It was from one of my children. Yeah. And, yeah, so I, I just felt like I was fobbed off and they weren't really interested in sort of exploring that route. So, I mean, do you find that happens a lot? Or is there something I should have done in that? I don't know. I just felt a bit depleted after it all. No, I, I understand. Um, I, I, I had a similar experience with my own diagnosis. I, um, I, I sought a diagnosis of ADHD when I was, in, when I was 18. And... Um, I told told the GP and he he said that nah, it's very common you know it's just lack of lack of concentration same as any student, um, but then obviously later in life kind of had it but validated a bit more and felt better about it. Um, my advice would be if you've got any, um, if you've got any kind of evidence from school or um, uh, or well, I don't know how old how old your child is but if you if you've got any evidence from other circumstances or other environments where you can say okay well this is where it's making a noticeable difference I'd like you to kind of re-examine. Alternatively, it might just be the wrong GP if they're being dismissive. Uh, I don't know if you could, if it, if it would be worth changing at all. Yeah, school was a bit. Um, yeah, some teachers were actively saying, "Look, I think you should um, have him checked out." Mm. And one that was supposed to be the um, the expert, the um, SEN. The SEN yes. Um, he, he said, no, he's got a bad attitude and he's lazy. So, oh, right. again, that put me off as well. So, yeah, yeah quite conflicting information from the school. <laughs> well, I'm sorry that, you, sorry that you've sorry that you been told that. That, does, that sounds quite disheartening. Um, yeah, I don't know, that's a difficult one. Are you in touch with the paediatrician at all? Anyone involved with his care? No, no. Like, he, yeah, he, like, he gets on fine, you know, but there's... There's things that suggest he could um, possibly be, I would say, ADD rather than ADHD. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, but, yeah, it's just, it's difficult because you, you're sort of told yes, then no, then yeah. the doctor doesn't seem particularly interested. And yeah. We've, we've just left it for the last few years anyway. He seems to be getting on okay. So. Yeah. Yeah, I'd... It, it, it's an annoying thing and, and, and that's kind of what I was hinting at when I was talking about our services that um, the professionals can kind of take over the process and at the end of the day you know your child best you also know yourself best so typically you're going to have the best view on what the problem might be and if you're being if, if you're seeing in a school circumstance um, some teachers are saying yes but the, um, the SEN amazingly told you that he's got a bad attitude and is lazy which I don't think anyone any teacher should really say about a student um yeah I, I don't know there is a tendency among services and among um, professionals to be dismissive um I would say if you've got a hunch I would just say chase for it and, and really try and you know make your case if you can okay thank you no worries is that it we all good Okay. Um, oh, hello. <laughs> hey, Rad. I just turn. listened to the last five minutes there, yeah. Yeah, no worries. That, that, that sounds brilliant. Um, that was really interesting questions coming in there. And, uh, yeah, very, very informative. Um, yeah, you've recorded this, haven't you, Rad? I, I haven't. I, th I meant to, but you did. Yeah, I've got both parts of it now. I should do. Uh, okay, brilliant. Um, can you get it in some sort of format that I can use. I don't know what would be the easiest way of doing it. Do you say you're going to put it on YouTube or something? Yeah, what I'll probably do is I will um, I'm going to send it over to the IT guy at our company. I'll probably have to Dropbox it or something and then probably upload it to YouTube. But if if I, if you want me to just send you the un, un, the the two halves of the video, I can do I can do that. Well, if you're going to put it on YouTube, um, when do you think you'll be able to do that? Um, 
probably in the next couple, next couple of weeks, I should imagine. Um, I'll just I'll just send you the link once it's up. That'd be brilliant. Yeah, if you can do that, that's fantastic. If anything goes wrong with that plan, then just send me the whole thing, and I'll I'll put it up here somehow. Yeah. Yeah, not a problem. But if you can do that, that'd be brilliant. I'd, I'd really appreciate it. It's just a few people are not uh, have not been able to make it today, so it'd be good if they can. Yeah, they can have a look at that. Of course. Yeah, not a problem. Okay. Fantastic. No worries. Well, thank you all for having me, guys. I've really enjoyed talking to you, and thank you for your questions also. Thanks very much, Ryan. Really Bye, all. It. See ya. Thank you. Bye, bye.